In this lecture, I look at a single individual, a poet and a writer, whose life and whose work in many ways became, especially after his death in 1837, as important to the definition of what it meant to be Russian, indeed what Russia was as a nation, as any monarch. Indeed, one might say, probably more so. Indeed, even many Russians today would still say that the life and work of Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, who lived from 1799 to 1837, partly defines what Russia is and what being Russia is all about. Now, I'll come back to this question of Pushkin as a symbol of the nation. But first, I want to talk something about the man himself and his work and, of course, his tragic death. I should make clear that this isn't a literary analysis of Pushkin's writing, his poetry, or his short stories. Rather, I'm looking at Pushkin with a historian's eye, at Pushkin as a cultural figure, at a person who reflected in many ways and fit in to his cultural world, as well as helped shape that cultural world. Uh, and in particular, what his life and how people talked about him tell us about Russia in the early 19th century, and especially at emerging notions of Russianness, ones that weren't exactly the same as Nicholas I's notion of narodness, of nationality. In many ways, and this is really characteristic of the whole story, Pushkin was at one time, at, at, on the one time, at, at, at the same time, a privileged insider and a rather difficult outsider uh, to Russian life. He was born in 1799 in the city of Moscow into a very aristocratic family that on his father's side could trace its lineage all the way back to the old Muscovite nobility. And this was a great matter of pride for him. As he liked to say, the names of my ancestors are met with in every minute of our history. He was clearly proud of this. His maternal lineage was actually even more interesting and complicating the story of who he was as a Russian. His great-grandfather was named Ibrahim Hannibal. He was an African. And according to the family legend, Hannibal was the son of an Abyssinian prince held hostage in the court of the Turkish sultan, who was then taken back to St. Petersburg and given by a Russian envoy as a gift to Peter the Great. This was in 1705. The Tsar, who always loved curiosities, decided to make this African boy uh, his godson and sent him to France for military training. Europe and military, two things Peter considered very important. And eventually, Hannibal ended up being a great general in the Russian army with large estates, all given to him by the crown for his services. And this heritage, too, is part of Pushkin's peculiar and complicated self-image. Partly, this was negative. Pushkin was sometimes taunted for his African heritage, and in fact, for his visible African features. Curly, dark hair, full lips, uh, African-looking nose. And echoing these attitudes, he himself sometimes hated this heritage. At one point in a poem, he described himself as a hideous descendant of Negroes. But this exotic ancestry was also a source of a particular sort of pride. The pride of being unique, of being an exotic outsider, of being something special. For example, in his uh, novel in verse, uh, Eugene Onegin, Yevgeny Onegin in Russian, he writes of fleeing Russia for my Africa. And note this theme of fleeing Russia. It would come up again in his life as well. In fact, he even began, though he never finished it, a story about his great ancestor, Hannibal, that would be called the story was to be called The Blackamoor of Peter the Great. Now, this complex heritage helped in many ways shape his complex self-identity as simultaneously an ancient Russian aristocrat, a really true Russian with roots in the old pre-Petrine Muscovy days, as a non-European outsider, a sort of double outsider, uh, but also as a creation of the Europeanizing Peter the Great. And this duality, it's actually more than a duality, of being both insider and outsider, as well as a creation of Peter the Great trying to transform the country, was all visible uh, in his life. Most obviously, he was a privileged insider in so many ways. In 1811, he left uh, his native Moscow for St. Petersburg, for the capital, where he was enrolled in a new lycée, a very elite 
private school that was directly attached to the emperor's summer residence uh, at Tsarskia Silo, meaning Tsar's village, nothing village about it, a huge palace was there. And in fact, the school was directly attached to the palace by a little bridge, and the emperor would periodically cross this bridge uh, just to see how the students in this special lycée were getting along. As a student, though, Pushkin preferred writing verses, drawing, fencing, he particularly liked, uh, to really serious study. But his early verses, which he began already to write as a student, were already getting him an appreciate audience, uh, even outside of the school. After graduating, as a good son of the nobility, as an insider in the system, he was given a very good position at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's clear, though, he had absolutely no interest in government service. The whole thing bored him, despite the noble traditions. This is what uh, one was expected uh, to do. But fortunately, the work was not particularly difficult, and it allowed him to do what he really loved. Enjoy life in St. Petersburg. He went to balls and the ballet and theater, and of course, time to do what he most loved, to write poetry. At the same time, we also see great evidence that that Pushkin was already beginning to feel himself to be an outsider to this system, and in more profound ways than just his distaste for government work. He began to associate with literary circles that were increasingly talking about politics, and even to political societies, semi-legal, illegal entirely, uh, that existed among uh, the elites. In fact, it was in these societies that he became quite close friends with many of the people who would be involved in the 1825 Decembrist uh, uprising. And it's clear that he, uh, that he shared many of their political and social uh, attitudes. In fact, in this, what might be described as Pushkin's emerging uh, Decembrist spirit, he even wrote a few mildly political uh, poems about the glories of liberty and the like, which circulated hand to hand, couldn't possibly uh, be published. He also liked to write, uh, mainly for the entertainment of his friends, uh, little satirical epigrams uh, about various officials and even the Tsar himself. Now the Tsar, Alexander I, learned about all this. Elite circles are not all that big in Russia at the time, and he was transferred as punishment out of the capital. Nonetheless, he kept writing, and although most of his works were not political at all, occasionally they were. Most troubling, in fact, uh, to the establishment were that he added to this mix of slightly critical poems and writings uh, attacks on the church itself. Like many educated Russians, he considered the church to be medieval and obscurantist and in no way fitting uh, for a modern society. As a result of these daring, if really still rather modest, uh, forays into the opposition, he was dismissed from the civil service entirely and forced into what amounted to house arrest on his estate. And this is where he was in 1825 when his friends attempted an armed rebellion. No one really knows whether Pushkin would have joined them and had he joined them been punished uh, as so many were with exile to Siberia. In fact, legend has it that Nicholas at one point uh, asked him to come and uh, talk with him about his role in this, in this rebellion and asked him, said Pushkin, would you have joined the Decembrist Rebellion if you happened to be in Petersburg at the time? And Pushkin's answer, slightly enigmatic but nonetheless telling, was, they were my friends. We know, in fact, that his sympathies for this movement were clear, and he made this most explicit in a poem he wrote to the Decembrists who were in Siberian exile. Deep in the Siberian mine, he wrote, keep your patience proud. The bitter toil shall not be lost, the rebel thought unbowed. And he even goes on to predict the victory of the cause. The heavy clanging chains will fall, the walls will crumble in a word, and freedom greet you in the light, and brothers give you back the sword. In 1826, the new czar, Nicholas I, pardoned Pushkin, uh, but in a way that reveals the persistent ambivalence of Pushkin's place and identity as insider and outsider. The emperor ordered Pushkin, under escort, to come back from his home in exile uh, to the capital and appear personally before him. This is the occasion in this famous conversation uh, about whether he would have taken part uh, in this uh, rebellion 
And Nicholas I also informed him, according to Pushkin's account of these discussions, that it was time for him to stop, in Nicholas's words, playing the fool. That's how Nicholas saw, saw all of this political dissidence. And to ensure that Pushkin behaved, he was, after all, becoming, beginning to be too important a poet to allow to be an outsider, Nicholas declared that he would personally be Pushkin's censor. In fact, he was assigned a special uh, official under the close watch of the Tsar, but he was so much an insider, but also so much a problem, that Nicholas declared he would be his own private censor. The results of this relationship were rather mixed. On the one hand, Pushkin did begin to stop playing the fool in some respects. His writings often praised Russia and its rulers, especially Peter the Great, who he greatly admired, uh, but even occasionally the reigning monarch Nicholas I himself, which earned him great uh, condemnation by some of his uh, friends and other liberals. How dare he praise this horrible tyrant. Nonetheless, Pushkin also continued to write politically critical poems, not for publication, that would be distributed among his friends. In fact, even some of his greatest works uh, such as the epic poem about Peter the Great called The Bronze Horseman, uh, named after the statue Catherine built in bronze to him on Senate Square in St. Petersburg. Even this was a work, as were others, with, were filled with subtle and not so subtle warnings about the dangers of unbridled political power and arrogant uh, political will. Uh, this poem in particular is about a great flood, indeed the very flood of 1824 that so troubled Alexander I, and about a, a suggestion of how even with mighty power one cannot control everything such as uh, the elements. And when an ordinary man suffering in this flood curses the statue of Peter, he rises up off his great pedestal and chases this poor man uh, through the city. A darker image of Peter I, it seems, emerging. There's even some evidence that in these years, Pushkin asked Nicholas's permission to leave the country, to emigrate and move to Western Europe, to flee, as it were, not for his Africa, but for his Europe. Uh, to go to the West, Nicholas the, uh, the I refused. And there are stories and evidence in the archives that he asked more than once to be allowed to leave the country. How do we make sense of all these contradictions? One view, the view offered by Soviet scholars, is that the true Pushkin was a rebel, a complete rebel, a, a Decembrist at heart, but had to pretend to be a loyalist in order uh, not to be sent to Siberia, in order to protect his freedom, to allow him to write uh, and even to publish. Another way to look at it is that both faces of Pushkin were, fee were, were true, were honest, uh, that he was both a loyalist and a rebel, just as he was both a Russian and an African, both uh, aristocratic insider and a troublesome rebel. In other words, ambivalence was the ground on which uh, he most often stood. And one could suggest that this very uncertainty was characteristic of what it meant to be an educated Russian in Russia of Nicholas I's reign. Now, to more fully understand Pushkin's peculiar identity and, most importantly, his place in his own time, one has to look a little bit more closely at Pushkin's style, his manner of living and writing. For Pushkin, one of the highest values was play. He loved to play. It pervaded everything he did, was central to his personality, and indeed, it should be said, was increasingly part of the westernized culture of 19th century Russia. In the Lycée, in the school where he attended at Tsarsky Silo, he had a reputation as a very creative young man, but flighty, foolish in some ways. Remember Nicholas I's comment about him. In fact, his best subjects were dancing, fencing, literature, and French. As a government official in St. Petersburg, as we've seen, he reveled in the pleasures of high society, as did many aristocratic and upper-class Russians of the time. He loved balls. He loved the ballet. He loved drunken parties with his friends. He loved to gamble, as so many of his class did, and in fact lost thousands at cards, soon going very deep into debt. And especially, he often said, he loved women. For example, he wrote in 1819 to a friend that two of the greatest things about living in St. Petersburg were champagne and women. And even better, he said, 
In Petersburg, there's plenty of both. To some degree, this is a pose, the sort of pose of the aristocratic rake, very characteristic uh, of the time, but it was also, to some extent, the life he chose to live. He finally married uh, at the age of 31 to an 18-year-old woman who everyone said was the most dazzling beauty in St. Petersburg. And at this point, he wrote to a friend that while he loved her greatly, it's worth noting that she was, his words, the 113th love of my life. Again, a pose, but telling. Most importantly, Pushkin's literary writing, so influential, so popular, also reflected this culture of play. First of all, it reflected it quite literally. For example, in his famous uh, novel in verse, Eugene Onegin, Yevgeny Onegin, begins uh, with a detailed and truly loving description of the pleasures of city life, especially in St. Petersburg. Strasbourg pâté, dancers' feet, French champagne, books, elegant clothing, and all the rest of the glories of physical, indulgent life uh, in the capital. All this weaves through the whole poem, uh, in fact. Secondly, and perhaps even more essential, his writing itself was deliberately playful. He explicitly rejected any notion that there ought to be high seriousness in poetry, or so he continually said publicly. For example, in 1825, he was corresponding with somebody about one of the poems that he had recently written called The Gypsies, and he responds as follows. He said, you ask me, what is the aim of poetry? Good Lord, the aim of poetry is poetry. And this was reflected uh, in his writing, which was exceptionally uh, versatile, playful, creative, imaginative. He wrote, in fact, in virtually every known style throughout Europe uh, and developed others of his own. He wrote epics. He wrote satirical uh, ditties. And his tone of voice shifted back and forth from poem to poem and even within individual poems. At one moment, he wrote with great high seriousness, with bloody banners and dead horses on the field. At another, he wrote uh, with witty uh, mockery or even a little bit of mild obscenity. Uh, sometimes he bared his soul deeply. Uh, other times he was quite distant uh, and aloof. In fact, lots of literary critics have talked about his style of writing as protean, as shifting, as open-ended, as in constant uh, flux. In a word, and this is characteristic of elite culture in Russia at the time, he reveled in the imagination reveled in the creative forms uh, of writing, and occasionally uh, not only poetry, uh, but prose. This was, in fact, essential to the pleasure people found uh, in reading him, essential to his popularity, central to the culture of his time. Which isn't to say this wasn't serious uh, play. Pushkin worked hard on his writings. He tried to make them look brilliant and easy. Again, to some degree, this was a pose. It's clear because his manuscripts so show careful crafting, much rewriting. Now, it has to be said that many literate Russians were beginning to get tired of Pushkin's virtuosity and protean style. Uh, already in 1825, there were some complaints that he wasn't sufficiently high-minded, not serious enough. And in fact, by the early 1830s, one begins to see a decline in sales of his books. It seems, in some ways, Pushkin was becoming passé. And then he died, suddenly and tragically. By 1836, his situation had in fact become increasingly difficult. Some would say desperate. His popularity as an author was waning. His debts from gambling were growing. And there were continuing problems with the Tsar, and in particular with the official given charge uh, of censoring all his works. And finally, insult was added to injury. And rumors came to him about a flirtation, or worse, between, between his wife and a rather good-looking young cavalry officer named Georges Dante, uh, a French émigré uh, who was the adopted son of the Dutch ambassador to Russia. On top of that, he receives a letter, while already worrying about this flirtation with Dante, uh, that suggests that there was a liaison between his wife and the Tsar himself. Remember, this isn't out of the question. Uh, his wife was the greatest beauty of Petersburg. The Tsar was considered one of the most handsome and dashing men in the city, not to mention the most powerful. Pushkin decided to challenge Dante to a duel. 
and they almost fought until Dante agreed to settle the matter by marrying Pushkin's sister-in-law, his wife's sister, who was also quite uh, good-looking. And Pushkin agreed at that point to back down that this settled that there would be no more flirtation. But this didn't stop either of them, either Pushkin or Dante. Uh, Dante, in fact, continued increasingly visibly to flirt with Pushkin's wife, who was now his own sister-in-law. So Pushkin, at this point, wrote to Dante's father, the Dutch ambassador, remember, a letter that was so crude and insulting that when young Dante saw this letter, he really felt he had no choice, given the rules of honor of the day, of the day than to challenge Pushkin to a duel. They fought on January 27th, 1837, the chosen weapons were pistols, in a grove on the northern outskirts of St. Petersburg, a grove that has the rather ominous name of Black Stream, Chornlya Rechka. Pushkin lost uh, and died two days later after great suffering from his injuries. Death transformed his image. It truly reminded people of what they had lost, their best writer, a sign in some ways of how mature Russian literature had become, how it had mastered and even gone beyond, many felt, European style, how original it had finally become. Contemporaries recalled at the time that all Petersburg was talking about Pushkin. Uh, his waning popularity was some, suddenly replaced with new uh, enthusiasm. And when his body lay in state in his apartment in the city, thousands of people came to pay their final respects. Some reports said that people tore bits off his clothing while he lay there, and then women even came along and cut bits of pieces off his hair, relics of the great Pushkin. His books, of course, began to sell out immediately, and the printers could hardly uh, keep up, and gov re government reports expressed open fear this whole thing might turn into a massive political demonstration. Nothing like this outpouring of emotion for a poet uh, or any non-government official had ever taken place in Russian history before. In fact, this really was, as the government feared, a type of movement of society, something still very frightening to the state, especially uh, to Nicholas I. In fact, the gendarme chief described the whole thing as, in his words, an indecent tableau of the triumph of the liberals. This was, in other words, in many ways, a powerful moment in Russian history, when Russian citizens were saying, we exist as Russians because of our common love of a great writer, because of what we share culturally and emotionally, not because we are simply subjects of the Tsar. Very hard to describe these feelings, but everybody understood something important was expressed in the feelings about Pushkin now that he died. Now the state the government gave warnings to newspapers, please do not make too much of all of this thing, and certainly not of Pushkin. But a few newspapers managed to do so anyway and had to be reprimanded uh, after the fact. For example, this obituary appeared in the literary supplement of one St. Petersburg paper. I quote a bit of it. The sun of our poetry has set. Pushkin has passed away. Every Russian heart knows the irreparable loss, and every Russian heart is torn to pieces. Pushkin, our poet, our joy, our national glory. And these were the first indications of a cult of Pushkin as a national symbol that would continue to grow. In fact, already before he died, there began to be something like this, a hint of the type of cult of Pushkin that would emerge. Uh, one writer, uh, Nikolai uh, Gogol, also a well-known writer at the time, began to already describe Pushkin as a national poet. Uh, for example, he wrote in 1834, Pushkin's name calls to mind the thought of a Russian national poet. He's the manifestation of the Russian spirit. In him, the Russian nature, the Russian soul, the Russian language, the Russian character are reflected with the same purified beauty in which a landscape is reflected on the convex surface of optical glass. His life is absolutely Russian. Pushkin's death made such arguments even more compelling. And the high point of all this came in 1880, some years uh, later, uh, but part of a growing movement of seeing Pushkin as their national poet, uh, when there was a huge three-day celebration organized around the unveiling of a great new monument to Pushkin that would sit at the heart of Moscow. This was also significantly the first major monument in Russia that was not dedicated to a political or military leader. It was built with public initiative, 
and public funds. This was in many ways a civic act by society itself. At the unveiling, Fyodor Dostoevsky, another great writer, caught the spirit of the moment and was greeted with what observers described as wails of rapture uh, in his speech. He declared, Pushkin was the most Russian of all Russians in his ability to express the spirit of any nation he chose. He was the universal man, and as such, the most Russian. His voice, Dostoevsky said, had the unique power to reconcile all of Europeans' conflicts once and for all, to show the way out of European ennui in our universally human and unifying Russian soul. Uh, Pushkin, uh, Dostoevsky later wrote to his wife that people were absolutely torn apart about this speech. Uh, the crowd was in hysterics. People were weeping and hugging one another and promising to be better people forever. In Soviet times, and now in so post-Soviet times as well, Pushkin's repeatedly been described as symbolizing everything that's great in Russia, everything that Russia is. And for good measure, of course, his name has been fixed into physical spaces all over the country. His name is attached to cities. There's a city called Pushkin to libraries everywhere there are Pushkin libraries. Schools are named after him, streets are named after him, squares, even steamships are named Pushkin. But what does Pushkin symbolize to all of these people? Obviously, I would suggest, he is a complex symbol like Russian culture uh, itself. On the one hand, he seems to be a symbol of true Russianness. Uh, and as such, he's often claimed uh, by nationalists characteristic of the very Russianness of being uh, unique and different from the rest of the world. This was most visible, it was said, in his language, which could never be translated. You had to read Russian fluently to really see what was great about Pushkin. He was something unique. But also one sees in Pushkin and the way people talked about Pushkin as the entwining of Russian culture with other cultures, especially European culture. It's cosmopolitan uh, character in other words, the way in which Pushkin embraced uh, world literature. Russianness and cosmopolitanism were both entwined in the meaning of Pushkin to so many people. Pushkin was also a symbol of true love of country, loyalty to, to the state. He was certainly claimed this way by uh, the Russian state and the Soviet state uh, later, but it's clear in his poems. He deeply loves the landscapes of Russia the heroes of Russian history, the unusual people, even its gypsies, everything about the country he expresses great love for. But he also is a symbol of rebellion against uh, Russia, even of a desire to leave uh, the country. And indeed, many dissidents have noted just this part about him that they most love. He understood what was wrong with Russia. We see him also as a poet who was admired because of his seriousness, his earnestness, but also his playfulness. And of course, ultimately, people often saw in Pushkin what they wanted to see. And I think that's in this ambivalence, this contradictoriness about the story of Pushkin as so many saw him, that one sees Russia most uh, clearly, the shape of its history, of its life in so many ways. Of course, Pushkin was not alone in defining what Russia uh, meant. Uh, next time, we'll look at other individuals who also expressed different definitions of what Russianness uh, meant, who made different efforts to try to answer that key question of what the Russian nation was, what its future should be.